having experienced the uh, multifaceted morning panel, it can be seen as a continuation, uh, this talk we are heading into, since the geopolitical challenges and complexity does certainly involve uh, Europe's security, but the Monique Perez is also partly touched upon here and there. US and Europe, or <coughs> the role of the military complex in context of the war in Europe. Now we turn our attention uh, with a deeper focus into Europe's security from different angles, uh, addressing also the role of integration or non-integration of the Western Balkan in this respect. Two of our panelists come from this region, as well as other panelists from East and Western European EU member states. Some, some questions are put on the table. In what ways can Europe adapt to and influence the changing global power balance? What are the risks and opportunities? And how might the incorporation of the Western Balkans, Ukraine and Moldova into the EU affect the security framework of Europe? We are really honored to have a very distinguished panel. We have on the panel politicians, experts of international bodies, and at the same time, they are academics as well in political science, security studies. Even we have similarities in the career passes. For example, both uh, <coughs> our speaker, Vesna Pusic and uh, Mr. Vuk Jeremic, the ministers of foreign affairs of their country, Croatia and Serbia, respectively. And both were candidates in the official UN Secretary General elections in 2016. When talking, he with the panelists in person. I could also mention that Nano Ruzin, a former ambassador of the, uh, that time, uh, Mo Macedonia to the NATO, was awarded the Legion Honor from France, and also Vesna Pusic uh, uh, was uh, uh, granted for her contribution to promote European goals. Um, so uh, we are planning, uh, as to the structure of uh, the panel, to start with our online panelists and uh, then the three panelists uh, here on, uh, in person. And uh, afterwards, we open the floor for questions and answers. Um, may I ask, as a first uh, uh, speaker, Vesna Pusic, as I heard from my colleagues, you were in Kurseg uh, during the 29 uh, years of summer university many years ago, a uh, couple of times, so uh, we are uh, happy to welcome you back, at least online this time, and hope that you come uh, sometimes again in the future. So, uh, <coughs> your ter uh, his term as uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs and European Affairs ran from 2011 to 2016, and uh, she has been elected to the Croatian Parliament for six terms. She is also professor at the University of Zagreb, and has authored several books and numerous articles in, the, in her field. So, Professor Pusic, the floor is yours. Uh, you are still muted. Uh, uh, can you unmute? Uh, yeah, it will be okay. So, then. again, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't be uh, there in, in person, but it's, it is really great and an honor that you invited me uh, as a panelist to discuss these issues that are uh, close to, I would say, can you hear me? Yes, 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 it's fine. Can you hear me? Okay, because uh, some, something happened here. I, th I thought you couldn't hear me, but if you can. Um, to discuss these issues that, in my opinion, are maybe as important now as they were 20 years ago when during the so-called Big Bang, when, when the first group of... Um, East European countries joined the European Union. Uh, it, in a way, the times has, have changed so dramatically in the meantime that sometimes it looks as if you know that was in an in another life. Uh, security was not an issue 
uh, as far as European Union is concerned, uh, it was considered sufficient to have NATO. Uh, it was also considered primarily at that time, there was still the, the old uh, saying, uh, I think, uh, by James Carville, the, the Clinton advisor, it's the economy stupid. So the economy was the big thing of the European Union and the big success. And enlargement was a big success um, all around. And security was considered a done deal. Uh, as far as Europe was concerned, uh, so much so th that, for instance, to this day, there is no defense commissioner uh, for within the Commission of the European Union. That, of course, has, has all been changing, I would say, since 2008, 2007, 2008, the big financial crisis, but then dramatically... Uh, on one level, 2014, annexation of Crimea and invasion of Eastern Ukraine by the Russians. And then, of course, the all out invasion of uh, and Russia's war on Ukraine. That was maybe one aspect. And the other aspect was the, the tenure of former President Donald Trump in America that also showed that this alliance that everybody thought was absolutely unquestionable, the alliance between the European Union and the United States and the, the NATO security umbrella is not necessarily as unchangeable as we used to think before Trump. So we are in a situation in which Europe, which we thought was, again, to start with, I would say it's the best project Europeans, definitely Europeans ever had. Maybe it's one of the best projects ever. Uh, that for many years looked like the place of stability and security. And I think we have now reached a time when in many ways Europe also needs us. And it's not only that we need Europe and can rely on Europe, but we can we also need to, to take care of Europe. It's our project. It's something that, that um, sort of guarantees a certain level of human rights, uh, rule of law, accountability, decency of government, all kinds of things that are sort of disappearing in front of our eyes globally. And if we want to regain it or maintain it, I think we need to be aware of the fact that it's not just you know, getting something out of Europe, it's maintaining this project because none of us are big enough to play any significant role, even countries like Germany and France, to play any significant role globally without this uh, European context in a world in which Europe, God forbid, but if Donald Trump is elected again, which is not completely impossible, although increasingly, hopefully unlikely, uh, Europe can find itself uh, between or among three autocracies, the Russian, the Chinese, and the American. And therefore, Europe has to start thinking seriously about its own security and about sort of its own capacity to transform itself into a serious geopolitical player. As you remember, Ursula von der Leyen, in her first mandate, when she uh, put together the commission, said this is going to be a geopolitical commission. Well, it hasn't been such a huge geopolitical commission, but now it seriously needs to be a, a geopolitical commission. And 
Europe has to sort of come to this, this point where it actually plays an important role and becomes, as they say, a real player and not just a payer. How does Western Balkans figure in this whole project? Western Balkans is a sort of strange term invented for the countries uh, in the Balkans or in Southeastern Europe that are surrounded by European territory, but are not members of uh, the European Union. Until 1st of, of July 2013, Croatia was Western Balkans. After that, it became European Union, and now you have six members of this group, Western Balkans. It is not even a European anteroom, it's European courtroom. It's a European courtyard, sorry, not courtroom, but courtyard in the sense that it's surrounded by Europe, European territory. At the same time, it's sort of been left on the sidelines for many years. The original idea in Thessaloniki in 2003 that all these countries will become members of the European Union resulted only with Slovenia and Croatia becoming members of the European Union. And for the rest of the countries, they're sort of in, the, in this EU waiting room where their political... I would say uh, leaderships, climate, uh, aspirations, uh, even public opinion has changed over these many years, over, over the years uh, while they were in the waiting room. Why does this courtyard, non-EU courtyard of the European Union, why does it matter? It matters because, first of all, it's an ideal territory for destabilizing Europe. And Russia's influence in these countries has been focused not so much and not primarily on uh, dest destabilizing these countries as such, because that isn't their primar primary objective here but it has been focused primarily on through destabilizing this region, destabilizing European Union. Because in that sense, Western Balkans is an ideal area to, even historically, and certainly at the moment, to per permanently and perpetually destabilize Europe. Uh, this region is also important for the European Union because it's in many ways a border area and an area that could provide security in terms of people smuggling, uh, not to speak about armament smuggling and in general sort of this trans trans and international uh, cra crime uh, that finds its, its uh, basis in this region and in this area potentially uh, that's so close to Europe, but not actually part of Europe. Uh, it can also become a territory with, that's from which people are emigrating into European Union and many young people from this region have actually decided to join the European Union individually and simply travel into Europe. And that, of course, has effect on stability, security, and political profile of the countries in, in this region. Um, it is also by actually having waited for so many, so many years, it has also given rise to different populist politics and populist uh, leaders that then, of course, can influence uh, uh, European politics in many different ways. I would say that Western Balkans has been, it maybe now looks as sort of 
an area that is very difficult to, would be difficult to integrate, not because there are so many people there, because they're not, but because there are so many presidents and prime ministers. In other words, there are, with a small population, you have six new members of the European Council, which is the, of course, the, the key decision-making or would have a key decision-making body of the European Union. In the meantime, of course, um, the atmosphere in these six countries has changed. But one thing that happened is that over the years, there were times, there were moments that were absolutely right for making the big progress towards uh, European membership. And for these countries, that's important because it's not, it doesn't only mean becoming a member of a nice club of rich countries. It also means, or I would say it primarily means state building, means that you can actually uh, use the, the collective experience of uh, Europe, EU member states and speed up building institutions, uh, putting in place procedures and making states more stable, predictable and ready for, for rule of law. Unfortunately, these moments that you have, and I call this the tale of small tragedies, because you have for all the six countries over the past 20 years, you had moments when they were right and when they were ready and when a lot of things were doable that today look absolutely, you know, sort of a, a distant shore. And I will just very fast go through some examples. Bosnia-Herzegovina today, the key problem, uh, secessionist polit politics of Milorad Dodik. Milorad Dodik, was brought in as a Western sort of ally who was very different until, let's say, 2010. So from, 2000, from 1998, when he came in, to 2010, there were different opportunities where Bosnia-Herzegovina could have been moved uh, forward, where its constitution could have been changed, which, as you probably know, has been and still is Appendix 4 of the Dayton Peace Agreement, uh, which is a, li a little strange for a country to have, a, for so many years, a constitution that is an appendix to a peace agreement. So there are times when this was doable, today, Dodik is a serious obstacle. And the question how to approach that becomes a completely different question from what it was, let's say, in 2010 or before, before that. Uh, Serbia had uh, five uh, the period between, uh, uh, the, during the mandate of uh, assassinated Prime Minister Djindjic, where it could have moved forward very fast. And also, so that was early 2000s, and also the early years of prime minister, ministership of current president Vucic, for instance, when they started negotiations in 2014, uh, the public opinion was in the 70s or even yeah, very, very high support for membership in the European Union. Today, it's in the 30s. So this becomes a much bigger problem. Montenegro between uh, before the elections of 2020, not to go into details, Macedonia, North Macedonia, of course, after the Prespa agreement that was missed. Uh, Kosovo, I would say for Kosovo, the time is now. It's really carpe diem. They have uh, non-corrupt leadership at the moment. And the time to make a move is, is right now. And Albania somehow was left on the sidelines uh, completely uh, unjustifiably and unjust, unjustly, but it somehow uh, was nobody's priority.
Um, may I say it's about tw two minutes yes, now? Yes, I will <laughs> stop. I will stop here. I just say, wanted to say, Ed, that I'm listing uh, all these missed opportunities, not to cry over them, but to say that it is extremely important to be able to notice the right moment for Europe to become a player and for future members to make the crucial step forward. And if we miss that, that can cost us security and that can cost us decades in stability. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, your closing point was a very uh, important point. And uh, uh, let me go further. And uh, I would like to introduce uh, Mr. Buki Eremic, who is currently president of the Center of International Relations and Sustainable Development in Serbia with a seat uh, both in Belgrade and New York. If I am well informed, you are joining us now from New York. Um, and uh, just uh, uh, over the weekend, I came across uh, uh, by in other research uh, of an article of Andrei Kortunov, who was a speaker at three different events uh, uh, of IASC uh, in 2019, also in person. Uh, and uh, it appeared uh, in the paper uh, in uh, 24 um, winter, which you are the chief editor of. <laughs> so the world is really small, and that's uh, I ask my name to give platform uh, to discussions of uh, very experienced academics and, and, and speakers. Uh, Mr. Jeremic, uh, apart from the credentials I was, was already mentioned uh, in the beginning, is professor at, uh, of practice at Science Po Paris School of International Affairs, where he's teaching a full graduate course, Introduction to Contemporary Geopolitics. Uh, so um, the floor is yours, and we are looking forward to your contribution. Well, thank you very much for this most uh, kind introduction. Uh, it's a great honor for me to be for the first time part of uh, the uh, Korsheg uh, Summer University. Uh, I apologize for not being able to make it in person. I promise next year um, that I'd be uh, capable of coming in person. Uh, warm greetings from uh, New York. Uh, I'm actually... Uh, at a hotel in New York, which is on um, 50th uh, Street and 3rd Avenue. And uh, my good friend Vesna probably knows about the hotel because it's a little bit like uh, uh, a Balkans place uh, in New York. It's not too far away from the United Nations. It is um, owned by a family from Montenegro that is half Bosnian and half Albanian. And most of the staff that works in the hotel are from um, either former Yugoslavia or Albania. And everybody knows everybody. And during the UN uh, high-level week, uh, most of national delegations uh, from uh, the former Yugoslavia, they're staying in this hotel. Everybody's very friendly. Uh, uh, everybody's uh, friendly here in the hotel, even when on the East River itself, uh, the situation is somewhat uh, diplomatically tense. Uh, between um, some of us. So uh, when my friends from America come and, uh, you know, have a cup of coffee with me here in the hotel, when they see how we're like all getting along very well with each other, they're saying, oh, well, you are completely out of the woods when it comes to relations in the Balkans, and it must be very harmonious and very stable. Uh, but as we know, the situation on the ground in the Balkans isn't really ideal these days and um, in general for those who are not from uh, the Balkans on this uh, on this panel um, I don't know how many of you are outside but I'll assume that there are people who are outside um, the region the Balkans always looks as if it is uh, very tense and on the brink of a disaster uh, and the disaster is usually avoided it rarely happens although when it does happen the consequences uh, could be quite uh, catastrophic and dramatic and the last time the last period uh, of such drama was um, in the 1990s where we had 
uh, very bloody wars uh, of uh, Yugoslav succession, military outside military interventions, and so on and so forth. Uh, and then came the year 2000, the year of great hope, uh, the year of um, reinstalling democracy in most of the region, especially in my country uh, and Serbia. Uh, I was um, I was a student at that time. I, I still am very proud to be part of this uh, great historical development and, uh, and the opening of an era uh, in which sky really seemed to have been the limit. Uh, those were the good days, if you will, when it comes to uh, multilateralism, when it comes to uh, international uh, cooperation, not just in the Balkans, but throughout the world. And um, these eight years that followed, in Vesna mentioned uh, those uh, eight years, uh, where I, I would say a very, very big opportunity uh, for the Balkans. And in and, and some of uh, the countries, some of the nations in the Balkans uh, made a, a good use of this uh, era of, you know, everything being possible and sky being the limit and money not being an issue. Uh, and, uh, and some have had um, difficulties inherited from uh, the 90s, not exactly treated uh, perfectly uh, well, in my opinion, by the leading uh, actors of the international community. Uh, Serbia uh, had um, uh, democratic governments uh, led by Mr. Jinjic, who uh, was sadly assassinated uh, just a couple of years after assuming power, and then the democratic government of uh, Mr. Kostunica, and then the democratic leadership um, of Mr. Tadic. Uh, uh, that uh, prioritized, for you who remember those times, uh, Serbia's accession to the European Union. Uh, not necessarily to NATO. Uh, there I have some disagreements uh, with Vesna's assessment. Uh, you know, in Serbia, when you uh, say NATO, it's uh, security is not the very first thing that comes to mind, uh, at least not in a very positive way, uh, given the history uh, of the 1990s and, uh, and how the century ended with the intervention in Kosovo. Uh, but I would say that the year 2008 uh, was uh, the crucial year uh, for when it comes to the future of the Balkans or the Western Balkans, if you will. And that is uh, because two uh, significant developments uh, happened. And uh, most of uh, the challenges uh, that we're now facing uh, can be related directly or indirectly to this uh, developments in 2008. Of course, these developments in 2008 did not come from the blue sky because uh, history is a, is a very long stream of intertwined and interconnected events. Uh, but 2008, two things which I'd like to emphasize. Uh, uh, where the uh, unilateral declaration of independence uh, by the authorities in Pristina um, declaring the um, independent so-called uh, Kosovo and the way that uh, a number of uh, actors, in particular uh, Euro-Atlantic actors, uh, decided to embrace this uh, or actually um, encouraged, actively encouraged and engineered this development uh, was going to prove to be crucial for, for the prospects of uh, the Balkans being integrated in the European Union even today. And the second thing, which was not so much to do with us, uh, actually not at all to do with us, it was uh, the onset of the global financial crisis. Uh, which uh, came uh, as a blizzard, engulfed the whole world, and Europe uh, felt it uh, very, very significantly as it opened the door to the uh, the Greek crisis, the debt crisis, the crisis of the North versus the South, and this was the time 
again to uh, to lean on what Vesna said, um, paraphrasing uh, paraphrasing um, Carvile for Clinton. It's the economy, stupid. Well, this was the moment of reckoning when it became kind of obvious that uh, it's not just the economy, stupid. Uh, that uh, the way uh, you do financial transactions, the way you expand economically, the way you uh, conduct globalization or um, divide the fruits of globalization within a nation, within a continent or globally, uh, that uh, it actually comes uh, at a cost. Uh, it comes with a flip side uh, that social development is triggered by the uh, uh, financial crisis of Europe in 2008 and then followed by the migrant crisis of 2015 and Brexit and all other sorts of things uh, that made the uh, European continent look uh, uh, less of a fairy tale in a harmonious place than back uh, in the early uh, 2000s, prior 2008, uh, things started to change. It affected various Western Balkan countries, uh, but not identically. Um, Croatia, for instance, uh, managed to complete the process of uh, EU accession and became an uh, EU member in 2013. But I think that um, the bucket uh, stopped there because of uh, the impossible way in which uh, the statehood of so-called Kosovo uh, was uh, tried to be uh, pushed upon or pressed upon Serbia. And it doesn't really matter which government you have in Serbia. At that time, I was in the government and Mr. Tadic was the leading political actor in Serbia. As I said, very enthusiastic about the future of Serbia in the European Union, then our government changed in 2012, irregardless, I mean, of who runs Serbia, what kind of government you have in Serbia, uh, what kind of priorities Serbian government uh, sets forth, uh, accepting, agreeing to uh, independence of Kosovo that was declared unilaterally back in 2008 is uh, simply not going to be accepted ever by anybody running Syria. That constitutes a very significant problem for the European future of Serbia and for that matter for much of the rest of the region. Now to cut a long story short and I'm sure there are going to be questions uh, after we all finish, um, I think that uh, Western Balkans will not join the European Union. Uh, when I say Western Balkans, uh, all five or I don't know how many uh, countries, uh, depends on the count, depends on how you treat Kosovo, uh, I think that none of us are going um, to be in a position to take a seat uh, at the European Council, to have a veto power at the European Council. Uh, European Union is not ready to uh, have these five or six uh, seat, additional seats at the table, at least not for as long uh, as the decision-making uh, system uh, is such that it has a national veto uh, and all other uh, things like uh, deciding on the budget and so on and so forth. So um, everybody who's uh, serious, I would say, uh, in, uh, in Serbia, at least, uh, knows this. Uh, some people are not willing to say it aloud. Uh, some people, for, for some people, it's just simply not uh, politically correct to say such a thing. But uh, if you talk may, maybe to we, the uh, we keep a little decision bit. makers, sorry? Yeah, I, w I was just thinking that maybe we keep a little bit also for questions. Uh, 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 because there will be also uh, an, an approach from North Macedonia, so we are going through the panel and sure. then... <laughs> no problem. 
I am. I, I'm. Always, I'm. I'm very used to being interrupted when I say that we're not going to become a member no, of no, the European no, no, Union. No, 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 no. So <laughs> I pass on the mic to our friend from Northern Macedonia. I look forward to the question. <laughs> and no then problem. we sent uh, to France, Austria, and uh, <laughs> so uh, it's, it's really very good that we have uh, an approach from everywhere. And uh, some of you asked, uh, but actually, as far as I understood, both of you with. Vesna and you uh, are agreeing on the point that it's not very rosy when the Western Balkan uh, will join. And, um, and uh, now I think we should uh, give the floor to North Macedonia. Uh, to, uh, do you have a PPT? No, thank you. Thank you. Uh, the, the, just a second. <laughs> I just also wanted to say also for the online participants, uh, the name of our next speaker is Nano Rusin, uh, former ambassador of North Macedonia in NATO, former rector of Fon American University of Europe. He's a professor of uh, political sciences um, and uh, he wrote 15 books, his latest one titled NATO in the Contemporary and International Relationships. So the floor is yours. But my first language is French. Excuse me for my uh, accent, Franco-English. <laughs> the title is The War in Ukraine and the Consequences of This War for the International Community. Uh, I plan to develop the topic in five parts. First, the war in Ukraine through the prism of Samuel Huntington. Second, the economic and military political consequences on the international order. Third, the possibility scenarios of this conflict for the rule of European Union and fifth, Western Balkan. I probably won't be able to analyze all five dimensions uh, uh, because the time is limited, so apologize if some parts are not fully elaborated. I will start with Huntington. Huntington predicts two types of conflict in the new post-Soviet world. A, micro-conflict or conflict for territory, and B, macro-conflict or conflict for ideology and control. These two type of conflicts are ongoing in Ukraine. The micro-conflict between Russia and Ukraine is expressed through the war for the territory of Crimea, Donbas, and Lugansk. These regions have both geopolitical and strategic economic significance. The macro-conflict is much more significant is, as it is a clash of ideolo ideology following Ukraine's request to join the European Union and NATO. In essence, it is the clash between democracy and autocracy. This conflict actualizes other latent rivalries. First of all, the China-USA rivalry, which began with the economic war in China's ambition to threaten the hegemony of USA as a new global empire, and also the rivalry between Block states there are in favor of preserving current relations in the world and those that are in favor of revision and multilateralism like Russia, China, maybe India, etc. Second title, what, what are the economic and geopolitical consequences? Economic consequences, the war in Ukraine and sanction have discrepated the chains of world trade financial flows and globalization. Deglobalization has begun its march. Global society, global economy, and technological globalization are being deglobalized with a tendency toward original globalization. The war uh, caused huge economic and financial shocks in the commodity markets, the price of oil, gas, and wheat rose. Changes in the commodity price and fluctuation in financial market reduce global GDP growth accompanied by a several recession and rise in global inflation. The greatest China's expert, Jing Jing Xingong, believe that the erosion of American model from the time of Cold War, which relate of two acts, democracy and the market economy has begun. Francis Fukuyama developed the economic dimension of American hegemony with Zbigniew Brzezinski asserted geostrategical and hard power superiority. Concerning military political uh, aspect, we can speak about real world order, uh, some aspect developed by 
Mr. Ivan Baba, uh, the, o o the, the final outcome that will result of the creation of the new world order, they call the real world order. This order will be detect detected by three or four great power according to the their economy and military strength. Whether the world is moving toward a new, more balanced order. So, uh, also multipolar, bipolar or apparel system or simply toward the affirmation of the old unipolar order dominated by the USA. Three main agenda aims at reshaping to the international order. The first is that of United States, which is trying to dis de deepen its position of hegemony and the top of the world order. The second agenda is that of Russia, and it's its main goal is to stop the penetration of NATO in the border and accurate the Russophone Ukraine territory and crime. Uh, and crime. The third is the China's ad again, again agenda to become the dominant world power alongside the U United States. What are the possibilities scenario? Possible scenario. Ukraine and Russia are confident of victory and fear defeat. The defeat of Russia would result of the fall of Putin's regime and perhaps it is it the disintegration of the state. For Ukraine, defeat would mark the end of Ukraine's dream to, of integrity and of exit to the Sea of Azov and return to Crimea, Donbass and Lugansk. It would also be a great humiliation for the NATO. The defeat of Ukraine would encourage Russia and other actors such as China maybe to launch additional aggression. Second, uh, second scenario is like the scenario of the Marshall Mannerheim scenario. He was the Prime Minister of Finland since 1940 when in order to preserve Finland's sovereignty he, he, he gave up strategic territory of the USSR uh, or, or today in actual situation uh, for Ukraine to recognize the territory conquered by the Russian army in accordance with last Putin uh, uh, res recent proposal, maybe two weeks ago. Finally, the scenario of un uncontrolled escalation el all the way nuclear. Australian hi historian Christopher Clark has shown how the chain of decision led to the first world war without any actor seeking war in advance and at any cost. The scenario of escalation is fed primarily by speeches and idea. Verbal bidding constituted a real territorial trap or the trap of Tukidit, I suppose, and you know, but if you don't know, I will explain after uh, this uh, trap. What is the role of Europe, European Union in uh, Europe? The war in Ukraine has created a new geopolitical dimension in Europe. This is no time for romance, said Devil Penn, former uh, Prime Minister of uh, France. For that purpose, it is necessary, A, urgent need to, for economic recovery, strengthening of the military and diplomatic agility. B, dealing with all issue arising from the Ukraine conflict, long-term strategy and rigorous selection as necessary priority, and C, be prolong, prolonging the war. The European Union will have to walk a critical line, succeed in expanding as dangerous as necessary, will transform it to integrate new security imperative. The draws are uh, divi di dividing line between members from Central and Eastern Europe and, and those from Western U uh, Europe. And in the Western family, Germany is more inclined toward Atlantism and France toward autonomous defense. The European Union should play the role of diplomatic mediate between China, Russia, and USA and show that it is not just the Cape of Great Asi As Asia, but that is a brain with a big body, as Paul Verlaine called it. 
what are finally the consequences of stability in the Western Balkans? The Balkans is a region where nothing is simple, says French, uh, uh, French political look Nicole Gnesotto. The war in Ukraine complicates the situation in the Western Balkan even more. In the post-communist period, the crisis syndrome in the Balkan has been present since the fall of the Berlin Wall. There are, there are three types of potential rivalries. A. We need the framework of multi-ethnic states. B. Within the framework of tension between former Yugoslav units, and C. Tension with the principle of the good neighborliness with European Union members. Is geopolitics the main culprit? Geopolitics involves the analysis of rivalries between major states and their impact of the people living in the given territory. The Western Balkan does not building of the area of the world heart, heartland, uh, the theory of Mackinder, or the Euro-Asia, but the Rimland zone, like said Spikeman. The Russia invasion in Ukraine divided the countries of the Western Balkan according to another criterion. Republika Srpska openly support Putin, Serbia partially support Putin, the three NATO members, no North Macedonia, Montenegro, and Albania, as well as Bosnia and Herzegovina and Kosovo, officially support Ukraine. Unofficially, public opinion in North Macedonia and Montenegro is either divided or open to Putin. Albanian from Western Balkans support Ukraine. Such a, uh, such a situation creates a favorable space for aggressive Russian soft power policy. Russian geopolitics, Jelopotilisi and Alexander Korbiko believe that the Cold War is being waged in the Balkans between the conspirators of the unipolar war of the USA and the multipolar war, Russia and China. Korbiko believe that the trans transnational project of Russia and China, which would mean salvation to, for the Balkans are being made impossible by the West. In the end, we ask ourselves in which direction is it desirable for the Western Balkans to move this turbulent and unsafe world. If re regional uh, globalization occurs, it is logical for the Western Balkan to move toward the European Union. However, no one guarantees that new division or rivalries are possible on the, the road of as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, as I told that we have uh, speakers for all different spheres, and I know that Oik Soimoni uh, is uh, also preparing a more broader view of uh, the situation. Uh, so just to uh, explain his background, um, uh, he's from the Western European Hemisphere uh, in our panel. He started his career at the French Defense Ministry in Paris. He was appointed at, uh, uh, to OSCE in Vienna. He joined the Secretariat of the OSCE as Senior External Cooperation Officer uh, in this capacity, he worked with the EU and NATO, and his uh, uh, research interests uh, include disarmament and arms control, including his uh, book in the pipeline, Border Wars Around the World. So he uh, joined us now from Austria, uh, from OEEP, the Austrian Institute for International Politik, or in English, Austrian Institute for International Affairs. Thank you for coming. It's just... Uh, a jump of an hour drive from here, uh, Vienna. That's right. Thank you, and thank you, Aniko. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to you all. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here in uh, Köseg. Uh, let me thank uh, warmly the IASC for its kind invitation. Um, Aniko, I suggested that we could maybe exchange today on post-war Europe, how to rebuild our security architecture. That's actually the topic I'm exploring with eight other European think tanks with the aim to produce recommendations to our governments by 2025. So let me start 
uh, by comparing three milestone documents issued at three decades of distance. You have them on the screen. On the one hand, the Paris Charter for a New Europe signed in 1990 at the end of the Cold War. On the other hand, the EU strategic compass adopted in March 2022 and the new NATO strategic concept also adopted in 2022. As you can see, in 30 years, we have moved from a time of profound hope, pragmatism and optimism to a time of pessimism, insecurity and profound divide in Europe. However, the Russia-Ukraine war eventually ends, it will have major implications on consequences on Europe's future security architecture. The impact is actually already visible. For example, higher military spending, see Germany's uh, famous Zeitenwende, or Denmark reversing its 30-year opt-out of EU CSDP, see states somehow forced to align with one side or the other, and see as well international institutions questioned in the legitimacy and even existence, such as the OSCE, where, uh, as uh, Aniko reminded, I served uh, during 11 years. Actually, the conflict in Ukraine is the symptom of a biggest, uh, bigger crisis in European security. And by the way, it's interesting to ask ourselves, when has it started? Was it 2014 and the annexation of Crimea? No, certainly not. Much earlier. Was it the Russia, uh, the Russo-Georgian uh, conflict in 2008? No, either. I would say still earlier, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah, but I think. That you have to keep the, uh, yeah, yeah, but I think you, you listen to you. You can hear me, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, but uh, on the online. Oh, the online. Yes, yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you for the the reminding. Um, in my opinion, the decade 1995 to 2005 was the turning point with two waves of NATO enlargement and the alliance bombing of Yugoslavia in 1999. It was actually in 2007, at the end of this decade, that Vladimir Putin pronounced his well-known Munich speech at the Munich Security Conference, in which, as you remember, he criticized what he called the, U, uh, the US monopolistic dominance in global relations, and it's almost, I quote, almost uncontained hyper use of force in international relations, as well as NATO expansion. So 35 years have passed since the Cold War, but no stable international order has been created. Let me quote Angela Merkel, the former German chancellor, at her first public interview since leaving office in uh, 2021. I quote, it has not been possible to create a security architecture that could have prevented this. And that's something to think about. The question is now, can we draft a kind of code of conduct for the rest of the 21st century? Can we agree on rules for common security cooperation that would allow no more security vacuum? Can we make European security architecture more resilient on the long term? First of all, is it yet time to start rebuilding or should we exclusively focus on bringing peace and justice to Ukraine. Many might argue that it makes little sense to discuss architecture while the house is burning. It could even give a fake feeling of business as usual. Certainly it is difficult to envisage new negotiations in the present tense political climate and without a clear vision of um, the, the outcome of the conflict. But this does not mean that we should do nothing. 
Of course, it's premature, but with a return to more stability in the region, the difficult process of rebuilding trust will have to begin. And it's our responsibility, I believe, to explore all opportunities to reach that point. You might have noticed that wars often result in defining moments of consensus that allow for discussion on security architecture. That was the case in 1815, after the Napoleonic Wars, um, with the, the Vienna Congress um, in, in 1815. That was the case in 1918, with the Ver Versailles Congress and the creation of the League of Nations. And that was the case in 1945. But you remember that um, allies at the time did not wait for the end of the, the Second World War to start exploring options for the future. And you remember Roosevelt and Churchill meeting uh, offshore Canada in a, in a ship and discussing the war objectives and how to precisely rebuild security architecture after the end of the war. So I would say that uh, raging war is not necessarily an obstacle to in-depth assessment of Europe uh, security uh, landscape. Of course, the, the outcome of the war will certainly impact the reflection, but I would say we cannot wait. So let's start now. Even, yeah, I forgot, this, I forgot this example, but I think it's a good one. Even during the Cold War, you remember the Helsinki uh, Accords uh, in 1975, um, and it was, Inter interestingly, it was only a few months, even a few weeks, after the brutal military suppression of the Prague Spring by the Warsaw Pact states in uh, 1968, that Finland suggested to start a process of discussion that would lead to the Helsinki Accord six years after. So you see, no major obstacle to start discussing even while the war is raging. Can I have the next slide? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, we need maybe to stay a few uh, few seconds on the on the context. You you see uh, some 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 new trends that we need to keep to uh, keep into account. So the Pax Americana, of course, and I think the next elections in the U.S. will be determinant. The rise of China, as uh, SG NATO SG Stoltenberg recently said, China is moving closer to us. Uh, and you might remember China's peace plan for Ukraine. Also, the multi what, what uh, uh, Amitavacharya, Acharya, the, uh, the Canadian uh, Indian um, theorician, is calling the multiplexed world. So, a mixture of new players, new middle powers, you know, uh, willing to change the world order, like India, South Africa, Turkey, and so on. The West versus the rest, it's, uh, it's uh, Angela, Angela Stent, the, this quotation. The um, kind of feeling that uh, the West is getting marginalized uh, with regard to the global South. Geopolitical Europe, of course, but uh, Vesna Pusic already mentioned the geopolitical, uh, the, the Ursula von der Leyen geopolitical commission. NATO's new posture. Uh, coming back to deterrence and defense of the Cold War, and Europe moving north eastward, you know, like uh, with Poland becoming the biggest military player in Europe, uh, the Baltic states more and more assertive, um, new leaders like Kayakalas, you know, new charismatic leaders, and at the same time, the German, Russian, the German, the uh, French German couple kind of uh, getting weak, weakened. So that's something we need to, to take into account. The challenges uh, that, we need to, uh, that we need to take into account if we want to rebuild the security architecture, first of all, going beyond the status quo without compromising what already exists, and that might be the core divergence between Russia and the West. The West would say, we do not need new rules. We need to create a context where the existing rules uh, can work. And the Russian Federation would say, 
that new security realities um, have rendered the core principles of the international system somehow out of date, and we need new, uh, new, new ones, new rules, new principles. And the question is particularly crucial when it comes to institutions. Um, you know, we have, uh, we have existing institutions like the, uh, the NATO, the EU, the OSC, the Council of Europe, but all Western created and oriented. But what about the international organizations that Russia has created in the meantime, like the, the CSTO, the Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization and uh, many others? The second challenge, uh, and, uh, and this is a big one, what to do with Russia? The Russian Federation is not going away. Expecting its defeat, its transformation, or even its fragmentation is a dangerous illusion, in my opinion. So therefore, the place and role of Russia within Europe's security architecture appears to be a critical uh, issue. So the question is whether we are heading to a period of immense and prolonged hostility with Russia, or uh, should we listen to Pope Francis, who said exactly here in Hungary one year ago, that we should let nobody becoming an enemy forever? And I think he was referring to Russia. But that will not be easy. You see uh, what the French President Macron uh, raised sharp criticism when he re reaffirmed, even after 2022, that a new security architecture should provide Russia with security guarantees. Another challenge, which geographical scope? Only Europe, but what about the Arctic region? What about the Mediterranean region? And the last one, under which umbrella? So the NATO and EU are not available to play the role for obvious reason. What about the OSCE? The OSCE has been, has been crippled in Ukraine and is losing any legitimacy at the moment. So the question is which, uh, which institution to, to use? Maybe Macron's, speaking about him, Macron's European political community, but we can debate over it. Uh, or a kind of Vienna Congress with only the leaders deciding. Or the US-Russian bilateral talks. That might be a serious um, and that may be a, a serious uh, a possibility. We went through chal um, um, challenges and red lines. What should be the content of a future European security architecture? What should feature in it? I would say that the uh, European security architecture should remain comprehensive. I think we should keep the three dimensions of security, you know, the famous three baskets of Helsinki becoming the OSCE's uh, three dimensions of security. So political military, economic, environmental, and human. But that might be a difficulty with Russia, because you know, Russia and its allies tend to think in terms of hard security only, and they tend to despise or at least neglect human security. The European security architecture should cover uh, security in Europe and security of Europe. So also the neighboring regions, the adjacent regions. The um, security architecture should include security guarantees for the, what I, I don't like the, ex the, the, the expression, but uh, the in-between states, so Ukraine, but also Moldova, also Georgia, um, we know now that the Budapest Memorandum was an illusion, but we need, of course, to find something else. Should we maybe rediscover some forms of neutrality? Maybe it's too late, but I think uh, some opportunities have been missed with regard to neutrality. And we would need, probably, a conventional arms control regime, like the one which existed in the, in the framework of the OSCE, and has been uh, collapsing. Um, yeah, I think I will stop now. And I wanted to speak a bit about the, the preconditions to start. No uh, second Yalta. Uh, should we solve Ukraine before? Should we, should we solve all the frozen conflicts? But I will keep it uh, for, the, for the debate. One word of conclusion. In all cases, 
we need to be patient. History shows that negotiations on new regimes usually last decades and cannot be agreed overnight. The Vienna Congress lasted two years with, you remember, diplomats dancing and banqueting in the meantime. And the Helsinki Final Act was preceded by 2,400 meetings and deliberations on 4,560 proposals. So you see, it's a lengthy process. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, so the dancing part we would take over from the Vienna Congress, uh, and Finlandia Palace is still there. But uh, definitely we would need uh, to find a new geographic space for uh, another uh, complex discussion of that kind. Uh, last but not least, uh, I would like to uh, introduce our speaker, Nelly Kirillova. Uh, she is Bulgarian, but uh, when we attribute where she's coming from, she has been spending the last years partly in Budapest uh, as a doctoral student of the Cor Corvinus University. And uh, uh, in conjunction with this doctoral school, she was also in the European Doctoral School of European Security and Defense College with a um, field study part uh, in, uh, uh, also in Brussels, in the Brussels Schools of International Studies, University of Kent. So, uh, your uh, presentation, as far as I know, uh, is also connected to your uh, uh, deep research in the Black Sea region. Thank you very much. Uh, before I start, I would uh, like to ask you a few questions, if you don't mind, because it's uh, the last speaker, so you maybe fall asleep. <laughs> Question number one, who is academic? Please raise your hand. Academic, professor, doctor. Mm -hmm. And who is from the governance policy? Uh, international organizations, one, only one? Okay. Okay, two, two. <laughs> okay, so uh, who comes from a um, uh, conflict region, like the country where there is a conflict in the Black Sea region or in the Balkans? Who, who, who comes from a conflictual country? Who comes from the Balkan countries? Please raise your hand, Balkan countries. Okay, if your country is in the Western Balkans and not in the EU, please raise your hand. Okay, and if your country is in the Black Sea region and not in the EU, please raise your hand. Okay, thank you. And third question, do you think that you come from a small power? Raise your hand, small power. Okay, do you come from a middle power? Middle power in can include also empire, post-empire state. Yes, do you come from a middle power? Raise your hand. No? And do you think that you come from a global power? Global power, EU included. Do you come from a global power? EU included? Okay, thank you very much. So, this was uh, to cheer you up a little bit, and now we move to a more theoretical perspective on the conflict prevention and the power perception. I'll not speak about the case studies, of any of the countries in the Black Sea region or the Western Balkans, but I'll speak more about how we can prevent the conflicts there by examining the conflict as a result of competition for power between uh, global or regional players like Russia, Turkey, and the European Union. Um, here is the table of contents. As a recent PhD, I was obliged to do this all the time. <laughs> so I uh, will quickly go through all these uh, stages as the main focus will be on the theory because until now we spoke more about case studies today and um, yesterday. Uh, the contribution that I'll make is uh, about the new theory of power perception, the reaction and conflict prevention. And uh, I'll give a little bit the uh, empirical example of the foreign and security policy strategies of the EU, Russia and Turkey. Um, as an introduction, I would like to present the balance of power that could be a theory relating to two uh, bipolar world, multipolar, or a world of a lot of polarities, not only one, and um, ongoing tectonic movements as we have uh, right now, tectonic shifts, if I can use this uh, comparison to geopolitics. 
Um, the main literature that I use is uh, Michael Lund, speaking about conflict and regionalism, and then Mackinder. It's a very old theory, but I love his Heartland theory. Uh, and it is applicable to small regions if we combine it with Lund. And these small regions could be the Black Sea region and the Western Balkans, as this is the topic of our, uh, or the audience of our um, uh, group and summer school here. And my favorite is Baldwin, who speaks about uh, power, but um, uh, he's trying to measure the dimensions of power, but we indeed do not have a clear definition of power. So what I do today is uh, an attempt to explain to you how we can measure power by defining it in six groups and examining this definition in the competition for influence between Russia, Turkey and the European Union. And also we mentioned Huntington, Zezinski and others that uh, I believe you're very well acquainted with. So what is conflict? According to uh, Michael Lund, and um, the conflict is the ongoing um, event that uh, first it has the, uh, the moment when we can still prevent it, when the tensions are ongoing. But if we lose this moment, then we go to the escalation of a crisis. And the peak of this escalation is the war that we have now, in this moment, like the military engagement of different parties. And after this, uh, um, we have the um, reconciliation and again the peace building. So the purpose of uh, international relations and diplomacy is actually to prevent the escalation of conflicts and not to go to the militarization at all. If this fails, then we have uh, military conflict. Um, so how I look at the conflict is the competition for power between regional players. In this case, these are Russia, Turkey and the European Union in both the Black Sea region and the Western Balkans. Uh, China, Iran or others could also get involved or the US, but if it is only on the military side, the US could inv get involved through NATO. As I look um, in power in different um, definition, combining all different uh, IR schools, then I escape from the military only definition and I also have social definition and uh, different uh, scopes of power. So the main gap um, that we are not able to prevent conflicts in these regions at is that the perception of power differs between Russia, Turkey and the European Union. And the panelists today and yesterday spoke about perception as well. That when we have perception that something is very dangerous, we are reacting um, driven by fear. And this reaction causes unwilling and uh, not so good uh, um, results. And if we are able to understand the intentions of the other one and to clearly and logically explain why and what they are doing, maybe this fear will be um, uh, unnecessary. For this reason, we need to create a um, common understanding of power and then to, to see who means what by power at a certain time period. So the main questions that I pose is how power perception relates to conflict prevention, how to measure the perception of power, and how IR actors could use the perception of power to prevent conflicts. In this case, I focus on the European Union because this is the, the actor that I consider myself being part of. But it could be also done used by the UN or Russia or Turkey or any big player whose aim is to prevent the conflicts. Um, so what is common in this case? We have a competition for power and this competition creates conflict. This is different from the uh, way that uh, previous speakers were describing the conflict as a result of nationalist movements or local uh, ideas and uh, disagreements between the different uh, communities in a country. I uh, take this approach differently and these local disagreements, I look at them as a result of great power competition. So who is a big power, small power, great power? If we look uh, by the territory, um, well, it is one indicator. Another indicator is the economic development and also the neighbors and the, the stability of the neighborhood and also the alliances that the country participates in, but also the distribution of languages because information goes to the uh, population through different languages. And if you understand the language, you can be influenced by the information that is going on. But if in this right moment I'm speaking to you in Bulgarian, maybe a few of you will understand me and maybe some of you know. <laughs> and 
For this reason, language is also a powerful tool. These are small examples just to um, distract you. And then we go to the competition for what? Influence. And what is power? We need measurable values. Power is not only the militarization and how many people participate in the army, how many tanks we have. No, these are just uh, examples, but we need to define a clear concept. And my idea is that the hegemonic competition for influence can be uh, looked through two different aspects. The main actors who compete, these are the regional powers, and the elements over which they compete, these are the power elements. If we are able to define their perception of power, then we can um, prevent their reaction of competition. And the, the basic idea is that the reaction of competition is the reason for conflict. If we avoid the competition, then we are not going to have conflicts and maybe even we are able to construct cooperation or at least achieve a neutral reaction. Um, so in this case, we try to identify the competition. How? By dividing power in these six groups of elements. Number one is security and military. Number two, economy investment. Number three, energy climate. These three fall under the hard power um, umbrella. Then we have number four, diplomatic economic relations. Number five, governance and people. These two are the soft power. And number six, it's the exchange of information and access to information. And this is um, the sharp power element. And I'll show you how this works for the case study of the EU, Russia, and Turkey. By examining their um, importance that they give to each of the six elements of power to, um, through their foreign and security policy strategies in a certain time period. His, uh, here is a um, clear view of the elements of power. And this is my theoretical invention, which I hope to be useful to science. This is why I'm imposing it to you. You can take a photo, distribute it, if you wish. Now? <laughs> OK. Um, now, this is just the case study of the Black Sea region and why it's important for the EU, because it's a conflictual region, and not only during the war of in Ukraine, but uh, it uh, used to be in the past and probably in the future until we, don't we resolve the conflict, it will remain a um, questionable area. So we need to find a stable solution for this. And um, how uh, I'm doing it, I selected the period between 2016 and 2022 because it's rel relatively um, stable period with not major disruption. Before that, yes. After that, yes. But during it, it was rel relatively stable. And I um, took all the foreign and security policy strategies of the EU, Russia, and Turkey. I did uh, discourse analysis and content analysis of them based on the six power elements to understand which element is important for which actor at that time. So for the European Union, it's the global, uh, EU Global Strategy 2016 and its annual assessments for 2017, 18, 19. And the result for the EU, I'll just jump to it, is that high priority areas or competition areas could be economy, diplomacy, information access, renewable er energy, climate change, low priority areas, military and foreign information manipulation. This was before the war in Ukraine. So for Turkey, we have the colleague from Turkey. Yes, I, I have difficulty pronouncing it. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Uh, the document was Enterprising and Humanitarian Foreign Policy Strategy from 2020. <coughs> And I did uh, two types of analysis. Number one is the content, but the by volume um, shares of the strategy to see which are the most important areas. And the result was that the most important areas were, as the name says, um, economy and people. But then I made a second assessment, which was based on the number of times a word is mentioned in the foreign and security policy, in, in this uh, policy of Turkey, foreign policy. And then the result was quite different. The main aspects of it were indeed information access and communities abroad. 
For Russia, I did the same type of analysis. So national security strategy, foreign policy concept, and energy strategy were the available documents. The quick um, analysis on the volumes showed that the most important issue for Russia was energy security. But then when I did the in-depth analysis, it had a different result and it showed uh, again that uh, societies abroad were quite important. This is the result from the volume shares. It shows that diplomacy and military are the most important and this is not surprising at all. But the in-deep analysis showed completely different thing and I'm going to it right now. So this is the result from the in-deep analysis of the Russian and Turkish foreign policy strategies. In the uh, Russian one, uh, in which is in red color, you can see that the most important elements of power were government and society, followed by military security, and then diplomacy politics, and then economic governments and information exchange. And there it was very much stressed the communities abroad who had the Russian or post-Soviet mentality. For Turkey, the result was similar, but interestingly, the name of the foreign and security policy strategy is related to economy and people, social society and governance, but indeed the most important uh, categories of words used in it were military security, diplomacy, politics, and the surprise here is the information exchange, which was used by communities abroad who have Turkic language, not Turkish, but Turkic origin of the language. This includes Kazakhstan, Turkmenistan, and others. Also, Islamic religion, and this includes all the countries where Islam is um, used. And it also had the um, countries who had historical background uh, close to Turkey, including in the Balkans. So next time when you think about a conflict with your neighbor, think about who is the great power maybe initiating this dislikeness, um, or not exactly hatred, but unfriendly relations. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to the conclusion. Uh, the high conflict potential um, areas are um, based on security, governance, society, and information access. When the actors compete on this, uh, I mean the EU, Russia, and Turkey in this case, and the high cooperation potential is in economy, energy, and diplomacy. If the these uh, regional powers are able to uh, succeed, su successfully cooperate in them, then maybe the conflict will not be the main priority for them. And uh, the main results from this um, comparative analysis for the three actors is that for the EU, the categories of power which are the most uh, sensitive are economic investment and democratic institutions in the Western Balkans and in the Eastern Partnership countries. For Russia, this is energy security and people, as people we mean uh, people considered as own society living abroad. And for Turkey, these are military security, information and people again. But these are people abroad who have common language, religion or history. This means who had uh, historical roots abroad, not those who are recently moving. And um, finally, the misperception about the interest of the other uh, competitors might lead to a war. For this reason, the value of the elements of power is that uh, each um, the um, intention of each competitor should be clarified in advance, and then a mediating role could be played by our countries. So instead of uh, doing the conflict in the Balkans and in the Black Sea region countries, we could just try to um, balance between the interests of the global players in this region and try to accommodate our internal policies with what they're um, maybe misinterpreting about each other. So scenarios for Europe, mine are very optimistic. Regional powers can uh, agree and Europe could enlarge and accept both Balkan countries and Eastern Partnership countries. I believe in this and I work for this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask the IT to show whether the online participants are with us? Uh, 
Uh, okay, thank you very much, and I'm um, <coughs> really happy that you uh, could uh, stay all the time with us, uh, also from New York, <laughs> which is a little bit uh, later. And um, i in order to uh, let the audience who were listening uh, uh, very uh, uh, dil diligently up to now speak, so first uh, I would ask uh, questions from the floor. The first question uh, came uh, from our uh, uh, other speaker from another panel from Kosovo. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to begin by commanding Ms. Vesna Pusic for kind words and basically just stating the obvious uh, because I believe that at times like these we really need to uh, distinguish between the ones who are uh, in favor of of just you know, speaking out the truth, and uh, I'm afraid that I have to say uh, to uh, to uh, say something or make make a mention of uh, or comment on uh, the part that Mr. Yeremich has made. Um, by the way, for the ones who might have joined this session now. Uh, my name is Arbor Vokri and I work in the government of Kosovo. I hold the position of deputy minister in the Ministry of uh, Administering Local Governance. Um, um, I have to say it's sad to, to, to hear from a um, uh, politician and intellectual of, of, of that stature, uh, such as Mr. Yeremich, um, grudges from the past that can't seem to be overcome. Um, mentioning, uh, uh, you know, using phrases like so-called Kosovo, uh, and then uh, the unilateral declaration of independence. Um, I think it's more than obvious that Kosovo is an existing entity, and uh, yeah, it declared its uh, independence. Um, unilateral or, or multilateral as an alternative. I don't think that there are many nations in the world who have multilateral declaration of independence. I mean, I don't think it really makes much sense. Um, or if we want to expand on that, um, then we may take the case of Serbia itself, whose independence was uh, de facto declared by uh, another country, um, another uh, global power, um, Russia in the 19th century um, at the outcome of the uh, Russia-Turkish uh, War of 1877 and 78, and then the Treaty of San Stefano, and later on the Congress of Berlin. Um, so that that may be one way of declaring the independence of, of some country. All right, I'll try. Yeah, I'll try to cut my comment brief. Um, so uh, what happened? Uh, yeah, it was contested. Our declaration of independence was, was contested by Serbia, of course, not just Serbia, but also it, its allies. And uh, then there was the decision uh, that was ruled by the International Court of Justice on the July 22nd, on year 2010, uh, with a vote of uh, 10 to 4 in favor uh, of uh, uh, approving that the declaration of independence by Kosovo Assembly did not violate international law. Um, and you may think who could have been the one, the person or the institution to bring that case to an international court. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's none else but uh, Mr. Vukiramic himself. And uh, yeah, I believe that uh, it's a bit difficult to overcome the trauma of, of such failure, of, of, of such proportions. But um, I don't think that it serves peace or the common interest of the Western Balkans and EU itself. Uh, I believe that um, Serbia, the country, I mean the institutions, but also um, the politicians who may not be the part of the system and intellectuals, to admit the reality, it would be kind if there would be some apology uh, from Serbia or from uh, intellectual elite and politicians for its tra transgressions over the decades, if not centuries, towards uh, Albanians in Kosovo. But if not that, at least just uh, admit the reality and let's try to work together for a shared 
peaceful future. In the beginning session, uh, in the beginning part of, of today's session, we were talking about the militarization of the EU. Uh, I have to uh, mention the fact that our government has doubled uh, the defense budget, and it comes as a consequence of this kind of attitude that we are facing uh, from our uh, northern neighbor. Uh, so, Mr. Yeremich, I would invite upon you uh, to, uh, to, to think again. Um, I have also to, to mention, because I don't want to sound sarcastic, Okay, my final uh, final uh, remark. I don't want to sound sarcastic, uh, but uh, I value intellectual prowess of, of uh, Mr. Yeremich. Um, when he was uh, serving in, in foreign uh, in Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Serbia, uh, when he was talking to uh, majority Muslim countries. Uh, he was uh, bragging that he is a nephew of a Muslim family, the renowned Pojderas family. And when he was talking to the Western governments, he was uh, you know, making the case for Serbia protecting the Christian and Western civilization. Uh, so I think he can do better, we all can do better. Uh, let's work together for peace. Very short comment, and since we had a broad panel with a lot of topics, I really wouldn't like that we stuck. Uh, uh, it's, uh, uh, this uh, forum gives platform to comments uh, uh, from all uh, directions. Very brief. <laughs> uh, well, um, I do I do I have the floor? No, I'm sorry. I have another question for Mr. Yeremich, so maybe he can take uh, both of our questions. Sure. Um, I just wanted to mention that the Western Balkans, as it is today, it is a result of great commitments and efforts spent by international communities to close a negative peace and open a positive peace, a new chapter for the Western Balkans, so a new future for these countries. And was it successful or not? Well, uh, we can discuss a lot on that. But uh, nevertheless, um, it, it is not an option for small states to per perpetuate uh, this kind of uh, old uh, narratives and grievance and so on. So we need to accept the Western Balkans as a factual reality and do our task as regional and, um, uh, for regional and EU integration. So, um, I know you have an official position uh, coming from Serbia, but um, I think that uh, we need right now a normalization of uh, situation uh, between Serbia and Kosovo for the future of the region. So, uh, please, I want to know from your perspective how realistic it is to get back and rule uh, 1,800,000 Albanians with a completely different uh, region and after um, such such uh, such situation from the 90s to 99. So I think it's not realistic at all. So we should uh, maybe see for for a future solution in Western Balkans. Tell your name and where are you? Yeah, my name is Elira Lulia. I'm a, an IS fellow and I'm from Albania. So a lecturer and researcher based on uh, Tirana, Albania. So, uh, I, I, I will uh, give the word to uh, Mr. Bukiaremic uh, for the answering of the two questions. Thank you. Um, thank you very much uh, for giving me the floor. Uh, I pick one question. I think that first, uh, the first one was uh, more of a statement and an observation. Just to clarify things, uh, I used to be a politician. I am no longer a politician. I actually. Uh, do not hold any official position, nor I have any plans on uh, taking an official position in Serbia. Uh, I want to thank for the kind words. Calling me an intellectual means a lot, but uh, I'm, I'm trying to make sense of things by thinking them through. Um, I must make a, a correction in a certain way. It is related to the International Court of Justices. Um, 
uh, advisory opinion uh, related to the unilateral declaration of independence of the so-called Kosovo, uh, it did not violate international law because the court said that uh, unilateral declarations of independence are not subject to international law because this is not how you create a state. To make it more obvious, if, for instance, we decide now in Koshag uh, at the end of this session to declare uh, the independent state of Koshag by means of signing international declaration of independence of Koshag, um, we would still not violate international law, but on the other hand, uh, that would not make Koshek a state. But to cut the long story short, um, Kosovo is recognized by a uh, significant minority of international countries around the world. It is a part of the reality. Uh, I am not trying to deny that uh, the situation is very difficult in this regard and that there can be uh, very little hope of coming to a common position. And I said that in my opening remarks when I advocated for a more, uh, I would say, honest and transparent approach uh, to the European future of the Western Balkans, which cannot be, fortunately or unfortunately, in my opinion, unfortunately, cannot join the European Union under the current regional and global circumstances. Um, I cannot imagine uh, Kosovo joining the European Union with five countries of the European Union not recognizing it, Serbia not recognizing it, majority of the world nations, including two permanent members of the Security Council, not recognizing it. So what is the next best thing that we can do? And um, I must say that I was very uh, intrigued and impressed uh, by our colleague from France, uh, who gave a very deep and comprehensive uh, view of how uh, the future security and political architecture of Europe uh, can be uh, thought through, engaged on, uh, with respect for uh, the notion of neutrality of certain parts of the world. Uh, when it comes to the Balkans, uh, there are two neutral countries. Uh, one is Serbia, the other is in Bo Bosnia and Herzegovina. Um, I think that neutrality ought to be respected ought to be engaged with. And when it comes to the European future of the Western Balkans, in the face of this, for the time being, insurmountable obstacles, um, is to uh, actually uh, engage with the Balkans by giving it a uh, uh, special status uh, with the European Union. Could be a customs union, could be an economic engagement, which is part of the reality already. Europe is uh, the most uh, formidable economic actor in our part of the world. That part of reality ought to be underlined and enhanced and given, if you will, uh, um, an accentuated future. Uh, but when it comes to the um, regional powers or global powers competition and influence, which was uh, a very, very, uh, let's say, interesting and intelligent commentary by our Bulgarian colleague, uh, the three uh, big influences in the Balkans for many, many centuries have been Russia, Turkey, and Europe. Uh, I don't think it is utterly realistic uh, to try and engineer the uh, pushing out or extinguishing the uh, influence of Russia and Turkey in the region. It has been with us for many centuries. It is going to stay with us. Uh, but uh, the link with Europe, for the time being, the most powerful and the most engaged actor in the Western Balkans, in my opinion, ought to be enhanced and ought to be enhanced by having a uh, more honest, more transparent, more realistic approach to what we can do together, as opposed to, uh, in my opinion, unfortunately, pretending that we are still somehow going to continue along the path of accession, uh, which, uh, let's face it, we all know does not lead to uh, um, a materialization of our hopes from the beginning of this century. Okay. When it comes to uh, relations between Serbs and Albanians, Serbia and Albania, uh, between the two peoples, 
Um, I think we, uh, we ought to do more and we should do more when it comes to reconciliation, but we should also address and not try to deny uh, the realities that exist and the Serbian, if you will, side of the reality is that um, the independence of Kosovo that was declared back in 2008 is utterly unacceptable. It does not have to be an end of the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. Uh, these these uh, it for does and not against. Have to be a uh, 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 we, we there did. are ways. There are ways to uh, work together despite these realities. Thanks. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so we heard the position for and against, and since we were covering a very broad panel, so I would uh, really uh, ask either the panelists or anyone in a broader question. Uh, uh, but first it was uh, uh, Rubin Zemon who was showing. Yes, thank you, Aniko. Actually, thank you very much to all the panelists. I'm Rubin Zemon from North Macedonia. I ask uh, Phil, he, um, I have a question for Simonette. You said that you work in, um, for the OSC, actually, in Vienna. In Skopje, in uh, November, actually, was the, the summit, and it was a big crisis about the existence of the OSC, and should it continue to, to work, because it was uh, the Russian, actually, uh, not consensus about who will be the the chairperson, the chair state actually at OSC. And you also said in your presentation that actually OSC is not functioning anymore. But I think at the moment OSC is the only mechanism which has one kind of dialogue between the Russia and, the, and Europe and so on. So what is generally your opinion about uh, should the OSC sh continue and how to continue? Because for me it's good to continue uh, because I also worked once for OSC. And the second question, uh, you, you mentioned about the uh, uh, geopolitical strategy of Macron and, uh, and so on. Generally, we didn't see nothing. As a document, just it was a uh, uh, proposal from the summit, uh, but, but they are offering to the Western Balkan, to the members of this geopolitical union, European Union. So can you say much more broader about the idea of this geopolitical union, the European Union, as an alternative for the European Union membership? specific questions to Mr. Simone, so please. Thank you, thank you very much. I believe, um, Aniko, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the next panel will be devoted to the Macron's or to European political community, no? No? Or it's just, ah, I see, I see, I see. I thought it was because it's the same, uh, same title. Let me start with the, the OSC. Um, I would say that if the OSC did not exist, we would need to invent it, because as you said, it's the only mechanism available uh, at the moment in Europe, a forum where both the, the US and its allies and uh, Russia and its allies are taking full membership. Now, it's also the reason why the OSC is completely paralyzed. Uh, you know that the OSC functions uh, on a consensus uh, base, and I think it's the curse of the organization uh, because uh, everything is paralyzed, everything is weaponized at the OSC. You know that the organization functions with no budget, no unified budget since 2021. Uh, so imagine, uh, imagine uh, an organization with uh, 57 participating states with no budget. That's absolutely uh, unbelievable. Um, so I think the most, the most urgent thing for the OSC is to preserve its way of functioning. You know that there is a big leadership crisis as well. Um, the, both the um, Secretary General and the three top three positions were prolonged uh, last year uh, in Skopje, but only for nine months, contrary to three years normally uh, in, the, in a routine way. So in September of this year, we will have again this issue of the top four positions. I think the, the current SG will not be extended. Russia will object it. But maybe everything will be completely blocked if uh, Russia and the West cannot agree on uh, a name to, uh, to uh, lead the, the, the organization. 
we have also a big issue when it comes to the, um, uh, to the um, chairperson in office. You know, the DOSC is um, chaired uh, by a running presidency every year. So this year it's uh, Malta, and Malta was kind of forced to agree last year to chair the organization because nobody else was willing to do so. Next year for the 50th anniversary of the Helsinki agreement, it will be Finland. So we've been lucky long ago to agree on Finland because Russia, in the meantime, has, uh, would object to any NATO country chairing the organization. So thank God Finland uh, at the time was not yet a member of the alliance, otherwise uh, Russia would have objected um, uh, to his, its chairmanship, uh, chairpersonship. But after Finland, we do not know who will chair the organization, and I think it will be a big, uh, a big difficulty to, to find somebody, to find a country to chair the organization. So I would say, first of all, the OSC needs to continue existing administratively um, and also in terms of leadership, budget, field operations also, the existence of the 16 well, 16 before the war, but I think now 13 field operations of the OSCE uh, are um, in danger as well. Uh, the mandate might not be prolonged by uh, Russia. Um, so first of all, we need to allow the organization to survive, and then we need to find a way to use the organization. Maybe, we never know, maybe at some point the international community will realize that um, when a ceasefire uh, will have been signed uh, in Ukraine, maybe we will find out that, uh, that the OSC is the only suitable framework to speak about Ukraine's future. You remember that a few years ago, NATO was in a deep crisis, with Macron speaking about brain-dead organization, and you know that in the meantime, NATO has uh, recovered uh, and uh, is now a very useful organization. So we never know, but I'm a bit pessimistic. I'm a bit pessimistic, um, yeah. Um, the second one, the European political community. So you refer to Macron's, sorry, we speak a lot about my president at the moment, which might not be a good thing, <laughs> considering what he did to us two weeks, uh, two weeks ago, <laughs> putting his own country in a big trouble with this uh, dissolving the, the parliament. Um, I don't know what to think about this uh, EP, EPC, to be honest. Um, I, was, I met, coincidentally, last uh, week in Paris, Hubert Védrin, the former and very respected uh, foreign minister of France. He served under three presidents and is a highly respected man. And I was surprised to hear very positive things from his mouth about Macron's uh, European political community. And he said that we need, we need a kind of framework <laughs> with uh, Western Balkans, uh, EU countries, uh, and all the, all the European actors. So let's see, let's see what, uh, what um, we will uh, make about this EPC. So far, as you said, it's only three summits. Um, yeah, yeah, sure, sure, sure. But uh, yeah, um, maybe in the future we will find a, a role for this EPC as a negotiating forum. I, I, I do not really know, to be honest. Sorry for having been too long. <laughs> no, uh, Jean Cleary was showing up. Thanks very much. Time is tight, so I'll be very quick. Um, one for Loic and one for Nelly, if I may. And they're both intended to provoke. They're not. They're not criticisms, and they're, they're just comments for the purpose of getting a reaction. Your argument in favor of engaging in crafting a security architecture while the fighting is taking place is, I think, compelling. I, I've argued for the same thing for four months. Uh, I actually argued for it before uh, February 24, 2022. But the one element you didn't mention, Loic, and I'd just like your comment on that, is, as you know, in 2009, there were fairly extensive negotiations in respect of a European security architecture. 
um, quite substantial drafts. I have four sets. Uh, the Russian draft is still on the Russian president's website today. And this wonderful phrase, indivisible security, of course, has its origins in the European security architecture negotiations of that period. So in one sense, uh, if I can be slightly facetious, we've already been, ha we've had this on the table for 15 years, and that beats Helsinki already. And I think many people are arguing at present that the Helsinki approach is the only rational approach to being able to deal with the Russia-Ukraine issue in the wider context of a security architecture. So I dislike your comment on that, if I may. And Nelly, I th thank you very much. It was uh, very helpful. I'm sorry that I, I couldn't get a, a pre-cut of that last evening, but it was, a, it was a very helpful frame in respect of the introduction of a conflict cycle. If I may, uh, as a suggestion, you might want to relate that approach to the classic neorealist approach to foreign policy f formulation. And the reason I say that is if one uses perceived national interest as the point of departure in respect of this and then clarifies from perceived national interest national security policy and national defense policy and then thinks of the four classes of policy instruments, diplomacy, uh, propaganda, public communication, whatever you want to call it, economic instruments and military security instruments. It would be very interesting to see what level of correlation you got if you took those three powers in respect of that particular space. So you've got the data. If you've got spare time, it would be very interesting to see how those two correlate in that fashion. Thank you very much. I just uh, wanted to ask um, uh, other panelists, uh, Professor Vesna Pusic, if you have any comments to the other speakers. Thank you. Uh, just a short, short comment on, on two things. Uh, one is I was really encouraged by Nelly's presentation, who treated European Union as a power. I think we have still some uh, time to to reach that stage, and I think one of the maybe bigger problems of the European Union that it actually is not a world power in the sense of uh, world powers that that we talk about, not even a regional power. It's a very it was a very successful economic union. Uh, but now when, when security and influence, for instance, is on the agenda as the, the sort of key things in the international relations, European Union is not doing that well and uh, is not really, I think, hasn't really reoriented its thinking from uh, the, the concept of being so attractive that everybody wants to join to the, hasn't awakened to the new reality, which is that it actually has to have a proactive policy, reaching out to countries that are important for its security, to attract them and integrate them into the European Union. I don't think we are there yet, and therefore I wouldn't treat European Union, unfortunately, as, as a world power yet, or even a regional power yet. And as far as the discussion about the Western Balkans is concerned, I just want to say I'm a little bit more optimistic. It's a tedious thing. Uh, it lasts sometimes a very long time, but I don't think there is a fortunate alternative. There is a, a, an alternative that would provide decent politics for the countries of the Western Balkans outside of the European Union. Greece, Romania, Bulgaria all have long relations with Turkey and or uh, Russia and are happily in the European Union. 
but I think we have to work on the public opinion. And in that sense, Serbia probably is in the biggest problem, so to speak, because that's the only country of the Western Balkans where the public opinion does not in majority support membership of the European Union. It doesn't mean that it should stand up, stay down outside. I really don't think so, but I think it should be surrounded by success. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. And also Nano Ruzin was asking for the mic. Yes, thank you. I would like to develop two points. Uh, first, concerning origin of uh, Ukraine crisis. I think we had uh, dissolution of URSS uh, and with proclamation of uh, independence of Ukraine, that was the first sign of some problems be between Kiev and Moscow. Moscow. Second step maybe is to decide uh, giving of back nuclear arsenal to Russia because if you have some nuclear uh, arms, uh, the other country are not uh, 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 really decide to attack another country. And other point concerning French political life, now in France the people speak only about strategy of Jordan Bardella uh, Bardella <laughs> Bardella, uh, he, he will be probably prime minister of France and uh, his position is uh, then France will continue some aspect of Emmanuel Macron policy but they will, he will stop to give uh, the uh, missiles of long porte, uh, long, uh, yes. And uh, this is only maybe a big change, but uh, uh, I remember because every day I give uh, I regard uh, LSC. Uh, Macron said then France will continue to have the same position. This is now the little little uh, rivalry between Macron, like a president, and prime minister. Pro probably, maybe, I, I'm not sure, uh, Bardella, uh, and if the scenario continue, maybe uh, with Marie Le Pen, who is preparing for the next president, if uh, Macron uh, 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 the uh, the leaves, the lift, yes, uh, leaves uh, the his place, as president, this is also also possibility because uh, with new parliament, with uh, majority of uh, of uh, uh, extreme uh, right, he is not in possibility to to function as a president. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. Do you want to comment? Thank you very much for the questions, and this means that you paid attention. So that's good. I'm happy. Um, I'll answer one by one. So first, uh, regarding national interests and security, actually, um, before defining the concept of power, I decided to look at two aspects. One is security, which is the national um, concept, and the other one is the influence, which is the external influence. And that's how neorealism, neo yes, I agree, but I needed to include also information access, societies, and that's why I divided it into a little bit more ideas. Um, Minister Vesna, sorry, your surname, Pusic? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you very much for the question, but the, um, your country is already in the EU, and uh, you say that you're not sure whether the EU is a power at this moment. Um, I would like to say that this is uh, typical for the Balkan mentality, that we are used to I come from Bulgaria, so I say we are used to having the power imposed top down and it should come from above and uh, we just agree or uh, disagree, we're attracted or not attracted. But uh, this is not the concept of the EU. The concept of the EU is that the civil society is making the power. We, the people, 
are creating the governance that we have. And for this reason, we should not wait for the EU to tell us what to do, but each of our countries should respectfully um, say what we have, w which are the national priorities, and how this could best serve the EU ideas, because your country, um, Croatia and Bulgaria, <coughs> Excuse me, are in the EU and uh, Hungary and others, and we are the ones who construct the European foreign and security policy. And later, when our colleagues from the Western Balkans and Black Sea region countries enter, we'll be together constructing the EU foreign and security policy. So think about how we work together and not about how we are going to quarrel and we are waiting for somebody to attract us or somebody to decide for us. This is not the way that it, it will be successful for each of us. And the third point. If your country is not yet in the EU, I have a few questions for you. So number one, do you want your country to enter the EU? Yes, no. Yes? No? Raise your hand if you are no. <laughs> okay. Okay, okay. These are just to think about the questions. Yeah, okay, okay. Thank you. And then... Um, in our countries, we have uh, nationalism and emotions, but who is imposing these um, nationalist ideas and these negative emotions between each other? Because we do not win if we're quarreling, but who is winning? I would tell you the EU is not winning if we, the countries in the Balkans, quarrel between each other. In this case, when you think about the nationalism and the uh, disrespect and maybe sometimes even hatred to others who are neighboring your country, Think about who is winning from this. Is it China? Is it Russia? Is it US? Is it Persia? Is it Africa? Is it somebody else? Because somebody is trying to make you hate the other one so that you're not going to cooperate. It's very old rule, divide and rule. You remember from history, it's uh, working forever, even now. And we, if we continue the narrative, somebody else will take the decisions for us. And that's the last point, thank you. Director Mislivets. Uh, uh. Suggest something. Well, thank you very much for this very, very, very interesting panel. Um, thank you, um, Vesna, for joining us. We, have, we haven't seen each other for a long time, and Vuk Jeremic to join us. And thank you for sharing your, your views, even if they are very contradictory. Sometimes it seems that they are um, antagonistic. But we had yesterday a very, very good um, um, first day party, an opening party, and some of us stayed a little longer. Um, among them, the, our friends from Kosovo, um, <coughs> not so called from Kosovo, from, from Hungary, from, from Macedonia, and so on, and Bulgaria. And, and we concluded that probably we need here, but this is what we can contribute here in Kursag. Kisag in Croatian, Guns of Deutsch. We can, um, we can offer a platform to discuss things in a very friendly way, um, not representing political parties and ideologies, no hate speech. So there are certain Europe House rules, it's the, the post Chatham House, it's Europe, Europe House, uh, which will be 30 years old in September. And this is, I think we should continue. This is what we can offer because, as, as everyone knows, Europe is in a very dangerous situation. At the same time, it does have a chance, Europe, the European Union and the European political community, which I think is a genius idea, if it was Macron or it was Scholz or together, we do not know, but, or, or, or Borrell, but certainly they coined this phrase and certainly it's not yet filled with real content, although, although heads of the states show up, 50 of them, next time they go to England, uh, the birth palace of Churchill, and then um, towards the end of the day you, you are coming to Hungary, because um, it is kind of ex officio that um, the, 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 the state, the nation state, member state, which gives the presidency, is also hosting the, the European political community. So what I'm saying is that this is a discussion which we cannot conclude, we cannot finish, in an hour or two hour session. But I think it's, it's the very fact is very positive that you are here and you are listening to each other. My humble 
request would be to all of you, including representatives of OECD, the European Union, who are here, who are not here, although we're invited, and that why don't we put on the table some, some progressive ideas, one step further. We don't have to wait for the EU to solve things here. We are troublemakers, all the Hungary included. We did not find completely our role and our place within this, this very cumbersome process of integration. The European Union, many of the bureaucrats do not understand, they're not very interested in these small skirmishes, um, kind of heated nationalisms, yeah? uh, which do not bring any fruit, basically, except of give, give jobs for politicians. I'm sorry, I'm not talking about those who are present. Um, you know, uh, secret services, um, so-called armies, etc., uh, in an mm. you know, abundant way. I mean, look at the map. I mean, I mean as I'm talking to my Hungarian fellows. Look at the map. <laughs> wow, who are we alone? Look at China, Russia, United States, India. So we have now a little chance to contribute um, a little bit to a better world. Why don't we try? And forget about, I know it's Kosovo Polia, I know Hungarians love this, we have a, an anthem, we, we, we say a beautiful poem uh, 200 years ago written by Kölcsei, that we already were perished for our future sins. You understand that? We were already punished for the past and the future, so we can do anything in the Hungarians, because we are already super punished. And maybe this are, and there are texts in the Bible and everywhere where, which are, are simply outdated. And this is the, the, the super nationalistic exclusive discourse. It's completely outdated because it doesn't lead us anywhere. So why don't we try to come together and say, have good wine, um, we can bring yours, um, and, and continue this discussion, I wouldn't say every week, but maybe not every month, but maybe a couple of times this year. So are very, very welcome. Maybe you can manage to come here um, by car, by train, because online is a little, um, how to say it, non-personal, better than nothing. And I thank you very much for the being open. And, um, and don't feel frustrated. I think it was a step forward. And let's go further. And the next panel debate is about European values. So in a certain way, we can continue this. So thank you for the panel. And